C.G. Young, Psychology of the Unconscious, Part 2, Chapter 1, Aspects of the Libido. Before I enter upon the contents of this second part, it seems necessary to cast a backward glance over the singular train of thought which the analysis of the poem, uh, quote, The Moth of the Sun, has produced. Although this poem is very different from the foregoing hymn of creation, Closer investigation of the, quote, longing for the sun has carried us into the realm of the fundamental ideas of religion and astral mythology, which ideas are closely related to those considered in the first poem. The creative god of the first poem, whose dual nature, moral and physical, was shown especially clear to, clearly to us by Job, has in the second poem a new qualification of astral mythology, or, to express it better, of astrological character. The god becomes the sun, and in this finds an adequate natural expression quite apart from the moral division of the god idea into the heavenly father and the devil. The sun is, as Renan remarked, really the only rational representation of god, whether we take the point of view of the barbarians of other ages or of that, or that of modern physical science. In both cases, the son is the parent of God, mythologically, predominantly, the father God, from whom all living things draw life. He is the fructifier and the creator of all that lives, the source of energy of our world. The discord into which the soul of man has fallen through the action of moral laws can be resolved into complete harmony through the son as the natural object which obeys no human moral laws. Footnote. This is the way it appears to us from the psychological standpoint. End of foot, footnote. The sun is not only beneficial, but also destructive. Therefore, the zodiacal representation of the August heat is the herd-devouring lion whom the Jewish hero Samson killed in order to free the parched earth from this plague. Footnote. Samson as sun god. End of footnote. Yet, it is the harmonious and inherent nature of the sun to scorch, and its scorching power seems natural to people. It shines equally on the just and on the unjust and allows useful living objects to flourish as well as harmful ones. Therefore, the sun is adapted, as is nothing else, to represent the visible God of this world, that is to say, that driving strength of our soul, which we call libido, and whose nature it is to allow the useful and unglorious, the good and the bad, to proceed. That this comparison is no mere play of words is taught to us by the mystics. When, by looking inwards, introversion, and going down into the depths of their own being, they find, quote, in their heart, the image of the sun, they find their own love or libido, which, with which reason, I might say with physical reason, is called the sun. For our source of energy and life is the sun. Thus, our life substance, as an energetic process, is entirely sun. Of what special short, th of what special sort this quote, sun energy seems inwardly by the mystic is is shown by an example taken from the Hindu mythology. Footnote: I am indebted for the knowledge of this fragment to Doctor Van. Ophigison of the Hag. Hag. End footnote. From the explanation of part three of the Sveta Shvata Ropanishad, we take the following quotation which relates to the Rud Rud Rudra Rudra footnote. Rudra, properly father, father of Matras, wins. A wind or sun god appears here as the sole creator god, as shown in the course of the text. The role of creator and fructifier easy belo easily belongs to him as wind god. I refer to the observation in part one concerning Anaxagoras and to what follows. End footnote. So, quote. Two. Yea, the one Rudha who all the worlds was a ruling power, doth rule, stand not for any second. Behold those that are born he, behold those that are born he stands, at ending time in gathers all the worlds he hath evolved, protector he two three. He hath 
eyes on all sides, on all sides surely hath faces, arms surely on all sides, and all sides feet. With arms, with wings he tricks them out, creating heaven and earth, the only God. For who of the gods is both the source and growth, the Lord of all, the Rudha, mighty seer, who brought the shining germ of old into existence? May he with reason pure conjoin us. Footnote. This and the following passages from the Upanishads are quoted from the Upanishads, translated by Mead and Chattapadhyaya in London, 1896. End footnote. These attributes allow us clearly to discern the All-Creator in him, the Son, which has wings and with a thousand eyes scans the world. Footnote. In a similar manner, the Persian sun god Mithra is endowed with an immense number of eyes. End footnote. The following passage confirms the text and joins to it the idea most important to us that God is also contained in the individual creature. Quote 7. Beyond this world, the Brahma beyond, the mighty one in every creature hid according to its form. To the one encircling Lord of all, him having known, immortal they become. 8. I know this mighty man, sun-like beyond the darkness, him and him only knowing, one crosseth over death, no other part at all is there to go. 11. Spread over the universe is he the Lord, therefore, as all pervader, he's benign. End quote. The powerful God, the equal of the sun, it is that one, and whoever knows him is immortal, footnote. Whoever was in himself, whoever what, whoever has in himself God, the Son, is immortal like the Son. And then he says, compare to part one, chapter five. End of footnote. Going on further with the text, we come upon a new attribute which, is, which informs us in which form and matter Rudha lived in men. Twelve. The mighty monarch, he, the man, the one who doth the essence start, that peace of perfect stainlessness, lordly, exhaustless light. 13. The man, the size of a thun, the inner self, sits ever in the heart of all that's born. By mind, mind ruling in the heart, is he revealed, that they who know, immortal they become. 14. The man of the thousands of heads and thousands of eyes and thousands of feet, covering the earth on all sides, he stands beyond ten finger breadths. 15. The man is verily this all, both, what has been and what will be, Lord too, of deathlessness, which far all else surpasses. End quote. Important parallel quotations are to be found in the Kathopanishad, section 2, part 4. 12. The man of the size of a thumb resides in the midst within the south of the past and the future, the Lord. 13. The man of the size of a thumb, like flame free from smoke, of past and of future, the Lord. The same is today, tomorrow the same he, he will be. End quote. Who this Tom Thumb is can easily be divined, the phallic symbol of the libido. The phallus is this hero dwarf who performs great deeds, he, this ugly god in homely, homely form, who is the great doer of wonders, since he is the visible expression of the creative strength incarnate in man. This extraordinary contrast is also very striking in Faust, in the mother scene. Mistopheles says, I'll praise thee ere we separate, I see. Thou knowest the devil thoroughly. Here, take this key, Faust, that little thing, Mephistopheles. Take hold of it, not undervaluing. Faust, it glows, it shines, increases in my hand. Mephistopheles, how much it is worth, thou shalt understand. The key will scent the true place from all others. Follow it down to lead thee to the mother. And footnote. Bayard Taylor's translation of Faust is used throughout this book. Translator. End of the... Faust quotes. Here the devil again puts into Faust's hands the marvelous tool, a phallic symbol of the libido. At once before, in the beginning, the devil, the devil in the form of a black dog accompanied by Faust, when he introduced himself with the words, part of that power not understood, 
which always wills the bad and always creates the good, end quote. United to the strength, Faust succeeded in accomplishing his real task, his real life task, at first through evil adventure and then by, for the benefit of humanity, for without the evil there is no creative power. Here, in the mysterious mother scene, where the poet's, poet unveils the last mystery of the creative power to the in initiated, Faust has need of a phallic magic wand in the magic strength, of which he has at first no confidence, in order to perform the greatest of wonders, namely the creation of Paris and Helen. With that, Faust attains the divine power of working miracles, and indeed only by means of a small insignificant instrument. This paradoxical impression seems to be very ancient, for even the Upanishads could say the following of the dwarf god. 19. Without hands, without feet, he moveth, he graspeth, eyeless he seeth, and earless he heareth. He knoweth what is to be known, yet is there no knower in, of him. He called the first, mighty the man. 20. Smaller than small, yet greater than great is the heart of this creature, of the self doth repose, etc. End quote. The phallus is the being which moves without limbs, which sees without eyes, which knows the future, and as a symbolic representation, representative of the universal creative power, existent everywhere, immortally is vindicated in it. It is always thought of as an entirely independent, an idea concurrent not only in antiquity, but also apparent in pornographic drawings of our children and artists. It is a seer, an artist, and a worker of wonders. Therefore, it should not surprise us when certain phallic characteristics are found again in the mythological seer, artist, and sorcerer, Hephaestus. Wineland the smith and Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, whose followers were also famous, have crippled feet. The ancient seer Melampus possessed a suggestive name, Blackfoot. Footnote. He was given the name because he had introduced the phallic cult into Greece. In gratitude to him for having buried the mother of the serpents, the young serpents cleaned his ears so that he became clairaudient clair and understood the language of birds and beasts. End of footnote. And it seemed also to be typical for seers to be blind. Dwarves' stat stature, ugliness, and deformity have become especially typical for those mysterious Chthonic, Chthonian gods, the son of Hephaestus, the Carib, Caribi, the Cab, Cabiri, and footnote. Compare the vast, the vase picture of Thebes, where Cabiri are represented in noble and in character, ca and characterized form. And a footnote. So, the son of Hephaestus, the Caribi, to whom great power to perform miracles was ascribed. The name signifies powerful, and the Samothracian cult is most intimately united with that of the Ephalic Hermes, who, according to the account of Herodotus, was brought to Attica by Pelagius. They are also called Megaloi, Theoi, or the great gods. Their near relations to the Idean dactyli, the finger or Idean thumb, footnote, the justification for calling the dactyli thumbs is given in the note to Pliny, 37, 170, according to which they were in Crete precious stones of iron color and thumb-like shape, which were called Idean dactyli. So anyway, their near relations were the Idean dactyli, finger or Idean thumb, to whom the mother of the gods had taught the blacksmith's art. Quote, the key will scent the true place from all others. Follow it down to lead thee to the mothers. End quote. There, are, there were the first leaders, the teachers of Orpheus, and invented... <coughs> there were the first leaders, the teachers of Orpheus, and invented the Ephesian magic formula and the musical rhythms. Footnote. Therefore, the dactyly meter or verse. The characteristic disperse, disparity, which is shown above in the Upanishad text and in Faust, is also found here, since the gigantic Hercules passed 
as an idean dactylo. The Colossus um, Phrygians, Phrygians, the skilled servants of Rhea, were also dactyli. The Babylonian teacher of wisdom, Oneus, footnote, see the lexicon of Greek and Roman mythology, dactyli, and footnotes, was represented in a phallic fish form, footnote, in man, ancient pagan and modern Christian symbolism. And footnote. The two sun heroes, sun heroes the De, De, Dio Scuri, stand in relation to the Kabiri. Uh, footnote. Vero identifies the Megaloi Feoi with Panites. The, Cali, the Kabiri might be um, Simulacra Duo Virilie um, Castores. Polusis in the harbor of the um, Samo Fairies. In footnote, they were also the remarkable pointed head. They 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 also wear the remarkable pointed head covering Peleus, which is peculiar to the mysterious to the mysterious to the mysterious gods. Footnotes in Brace on the Laconian coast and in. Um, Pephinos, some statues only a foot high with caps on their heads were found, and a footnote. And which is perpetuated from that time on a secret mark of identification. Attis, the elder brother of Christ, wears the pointed cap just as does Mithra. It has also become traditional for our present day Chthonian infantile gods, the brownies, the natis, and all the typical kinds of dwarves. Um, footnote that the monks have again invented cowls seem of no slight Im, Im, slight importance. Hmm. So, and a footnote. Freud has already called our attention to the phallic meaning of the hat in modern fantasies. A further significance is that probably the pointed cap represents the foreskin. In order not to go too far afield from my theme, I must be satisfied here merely to present the suggestion. But at a later opportunity, I shall return to this point with detailed proof. The dwarf form leads to the figure of the divine boy, the Puer Eternus, the young Dionysus, Jupiter and Anzurus, Tages, and so on. Footnote. Oh, never mind. Um, in the vase painting of Thebes, already mentioned, a bearded Dionysus is represented as Cab. Boy Roy, together with the figure of a of a boy as Pais, followed by the character boy's figure, draw, designa, designated as um, Pra Tolo Tolois Tolo Tolo Aois, and again a character a charactered man which is represented as Mitos. Footnote: Next to this, there is a female figure designated as kratiai, which means one who brings forth, or Orphaic. Mitos really means thread, but in Orphic speech it stands for semen. It was conjectured that this collection corresponded to a group of statuary in the sanctuary of the cult. This supposition is supported by the history of the cult as far as it is known. It is an original Phoenician cult of father and son and an old and young Kabir who was were more or less assimilated with the Grecian gods. The double figures of the adult and the child Dionysus lend themselves particularly to this assimilation. One might also call this the cult of the large and small man. Now, under various aspects, Dionysus is a phallic god in his worship the phallus held an important place, for example, in the cult of the Argavian bull, Dionysus. Moreover, the phallic Hermi of the god has given occasion for the personification of the phallus of Dionysus in the form of the god Phlates, who is nothing else but Pri Pri Priapus. He is called Etairos or Suxamos Bakoi. Footnote. See Roche's lexicon. Phales. 
or comrade or fellow reveler is back is Suxados ba back uh backoy and the foot monk. Corresponding to this state of affairs, one can not very well fail to recognize in the previously mentioned Kabiric representation and in the added boy's figure the picture of the man and his penis. Footnote. Compare Freud's evidence. Um, but I must remark at this place that etymologically penis and penates are not grouped together. On the contrary, um, peos Pesunthi, Sanskrit pasha e, Latin penis, were given with the Middle German high visal, or penis, and the Old German fasal, the significance of foetus, proles. Uh, so, and a The previously, um, so, Let's see, where were we? The previously mentioned paradox of the Upanishad text of large and small, of dwarf and giant, is expressed more mildly here by man and boy, or father and son. Footnote. Stiko in his trauma, tra, tra Skimbolik has traced out this sort of representation of the genitals, as has Spilorin also in the case of dementia praecox. End of footnote. So, the mode of, of deformity, which is used constantly by the Kabiric cult, is present also in the vase picture, while the parallel figures to Dionysus and Pius are the characterized mitos and pratoleos, just as formerly the difference in size gave occasion for the division, so, that, so does the deformity here. Footnote, the figure and the figure Kratia, the one who brings forth, placed beside it, is surprisingly, is surprising in that the libido occupied in creation, creating religion has apparently developed out of the primitive relation to the mother. Without, end of footnote, without first, first bringing proof to bear, I may remark that from this knowledge of especially strong side lights are thrown upon the original psychologic meaning of the religious heroes. Dionysus stands in an intimate relation to the psychology of the early Asiatic god who died and rose again from the dead and whose manifold manifestations have been brought together in the figure of Christ into a firm personality enduring for centuries. We gain from our premise the knowledge of that these heroes, as well as their typical fates, are personifications of the human libido and its typical fates. They are imagery like if the figures of our nightly dreams, the actors and interpreters of our secret thoughts. And since we, in the present day, have the power to decipher the symbol of dreams, and thereby surmise the mysterious psychologic history of development of the individual, so a way is here open to the understanding of the secret springs of impulse beneath the psychologic development of races. Our Previous trains of thought, which demonstrated the phallic side of the symbolism of the libido, also shows how thoroughly justified the term is the term libido. Footnote. In Freud's paper, Psychoanalytisch Bermekugen über einen Fall von Paranoia us which appeared simultaneously with the first part of my book, he makes the observation absolutely parallel to the meaning of my remarks concerning the libido theory, resulting with the fantasies of the insane Schreiber. Schreiber's divine rays, composed by condensation of sun's rays, nerve fibers, and sperma, were really nothing else but the libido fixations projected outside and objectively represented, and lends to his delusion a striking agreement with our theory. That the world must come to an end because the ego of the patient attracts all the rays to himself, that later during the process of reconstruction he must be very anxious lest God sever the connection of the rays with him. These and certain other peculiarities of Schreiber's delusion sound very like the foregoing endopsychic perceptions on the assumption of which I base the interpretation of paranoia. End of footnote. Originally taken from the sexual sphere, 
The word has yet the most frequent te technical expression of psychoanalysis for the simple reason that its significance is wide enough to cover all the unknown and countless manifestations of the will and the sense of Schopenhauer. It is sufficiently comprehensive and rich in meaning to characterize the real nature of the psychic entity which it includes. The exact classical significance of the word libido qualifies it as an entirely appropriate term. Libido is taken in a very wide sense in Cicero. So, here he, say, he says, Volent ex dubus opi, opinatis bonis nas, nasi, libidid, libididem et la, laetitam, ut sit latae presentiam bonorum libido putorum lata, la, laetitea autem et libido in bonorum opinione versantur cum libido ad id, quod, quod viditur bonum, electa et inflammata rapitur natura einem omnes ea, quae bona videntur, sequantur fugiatque fug, fug, contraria. Quam obrem simel objecta species, qui spiam est, quod bonum videtur, ad id adis adip pescendum impellet ipsa natura, id cum constantur pridentcertirce fit, ijus modi appetit ab petitionem stia boi laid sin appellant, nos appellamus vol untatem iam ili putant in solo essis sapiente, quam sic defu, sic, quam sic defui def, definiut Volutas et, et est quae quid cum ratione de sidorent, quae autem ratione adversa in citata es vehi mentios ea libido vest, vel, vel cupidi, cupiditas effera nata, quae in omnibus stultis in venitur. Translated, from the good proceed desire and joy, joy having reference to some prescient good and desire to some future ones. But joy and desire depend on the opinion of good, as desire, being inflamed and provoked, is carried on eagerly towards what have the appearance of good. And joy is transported and exalts on obtaining what was desired, for we naturally pursue those things that have the appearance of good and avoid the contrary. Wherefore, as soon as anything that has the appearance of good presents itself, nature incites us to endeavor to obtain it. Now, where this strong desire is cons consistent and founded on pr prescience, it is by the Stoics called bolesis, and the name which gives it its volition. Then this they allow to none but their wise men, and define it thus, Volition is the reasonable desire, but whatever is incited too violently in opposition to reason, that is a lust, or an unbridled desire, which, dis which is discoverable in all fools. From Cicero. End of translation. The meaning of the libido here is to wish, and in the stoical dis distinction of will, desolate desire. Cicero used libido in the corresponding sense. Agere rem aliqua, aliquam libida le, din non rationae. Translated, libido is used for arms and military heroes rather than for dissipations and banquets. In the same sense, Sala says, era, era cundie paris est 
libidinis in another place in a milder and more general sense, which completely approaches the analytical use. Majesque in decoris armis es mili militaribus equus, quam in scortis et in convividis libidem habita habi bant, translated as the same thing. Libido is used for arms and military horses rather than participations in banquets. Like it's the same translation for both sentences. Also, quod in tibi bona libido fuit patre, etc. The use of libido is so general that the phrase libido in est scire merely has a significance as I will, it pleases me. In the phrase ali quam libido urine lasis la it, libido has the meaning of urgency. The significance of sexual desire is also present in the classics. The general classical application of the conception agrees with the corresponding etymological context of the word libido or libido, worth libit, more ancient lubit, it pleases me, and lubins, which e or lubins, which equals gladly or willingly, or Sanskrit. Lubhiati equals to experience violent longing, or lobhiati, which equals excited longing, or lubdahi, or eager, or lobhaha, or longing, or eagerness, or the Gothic luifs, and the old High German liob, or love. Moreover, in Gothic, lubians was represented as hope, and old High German lobon equals to praise, and lobe equals commendation, praise, or glory. An old Bulgarian lubigiti is to love, and lubia is to love, and Lithuanian leapsinti is to praise. Footnote. Waldi says, uh, Waldi in the Latin entomological dictionary says, see libet, liberi, children, is grouped together with libet, could this be proven, then, liber, the Italian god of procreation, undoubtedly connected with liberi, would also be grouped with libet. Liber, libet, tia, libet, ini, iani, is the goddess of the dead, who would have nothing in common with lubentina and lubentia, the attribute of Venus, which belongs to libet, the name is yet explained. Compare the latter com comments in this work. Libari is equal to poor or to sacrifice. In su is supposed to have nothing to do with liber. The etymology of libido shows not only the central setting of the idea, but also the connection with the German lieb or love. We are obliged to say under these circumstances that not only the idea, but also the word libido is well chosen for the subject under discussion. End of footnote. It can be said that the conception of libido as developed in the new work of Freud and at the, at the school has functionally the same significance in the biological territory as does the conception of energy since the time of Robert Mayer in the physical realm. Footnote. A corrected view on the converse of energy in the light of the theory of cognition might be might offer the comment that this picture is a projection of an endopsychic perception of the equivalent transformation of libido. End of footnote. It may not be surplus to say something more at this point concerning the conception of libido after we have followed the formulation of its symbol to the highest expression in the human form of the religious hero. A reader's commentary. This chapter is pretty interesting. It goes from the sun to gods to uh, this father-son or dwarf giant to uh, analysis to penises to, to words, looking at how words connect. This seems like a real stream of consciousness kind of chapter. And um, I would say that there's a little bit of evidence in that and that some of the sen sentences are not complete and the translations aren't all given. 
even by the, uh, the you know, by Hull. Um, so I, I think that this, I wish that I could like analyze this chapter like the way that, and analyze Young, the way that Young is analyzing Miss Miller by looking at this chapter. That would be interesting. I don't have the qualifications or enough understanding of psychology to be able to do that, but it, it would be interesting if somebody were to analyze Young through this chapter, um, the way that he analyzed Miss Miller. So that's my commentary.